All righty, hello everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Aquarium's Online Academy. My name is Luke. I'm joining you from the Aquarium of the Pacific here in Long Beach, California, and I'm in front of are those West Coast sea nettles? I think they are. So uh, we have a really, really interesting uh, program for you. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about invertebrates. Now, invertebrates are well, it's an interesting group to talk about because it's kind of like the everything else group in the animals. When we talk about vertebrates, that is any animal with vertebra or with a spinal column, a spine, a backbone, something like that, those animals are all part of this, are part of a group that's based on a shared thing that they all have, whether it's a fish or a bird or an amphibian or a human or a shark or a chimpanzee or a giraffe or whatever, those animals are all vertebrates. But then when we get to this invertebrate group, that just means that they're not vertebrates. So the vertebrates, the invertebrates are actually almost all animals. Vertebrates are a really, really successful group of animals, but invertebrates have been around for way longer, and they have all these different separate groups that aren't really, aren't closely related at all. So when we talk about different invertebrate groups, we're talking about something that's way, way, way more diverse than we just talk, than when we just talk about vertebrates. So just to give a little bit more idea of what that means, if we were to look at any kind of vertebrate, you would be able to see that it had a spinal column, whether again, like it was a fish, a shark, or a human, or whatever. But when we look at different groups of invertebrates, some of those groups won't seem to have anything in common with each other. So today, if we, for example, were to compare the jellies that we have here to a sea star, you'd see very, very few similarities because they're, they're not really close relatives. So the invertebrates are a group that we really have to talk about is a lot of different groups. And what they really are is different families of animals that share certain common characteristics. So we'll talk about some of those different groups of invertebrates today. And since we've already got the jellies behind me, we might as well talk about them for a moment. So when we talk about different groups of invertebrates, we usually talk about them in terms of the phylum they belong to. I know I'm throwing a lot of words out here right now, by the way. I got, I got off on a very, very technical kick here. But, but a phylum is basically a term for a really, really giant group of animals that all have some sort of shared characteristic and a shared ancestor. The phylum that you and I belong to is called the chordates. That's all the animals with a spinal cord. The phylum that these guys belong to is a group called the nadarians. The nadarians. Now, what else could be in that group? If we look at a creature like a sea jelly or a jellyfish, what other animals are similar to them? I wonder if uh, Dana here is helping me behind the camera, setting up, bringing up stuff behind me. Maybe she can bring up another nadarian for us to look at. Because jellies are just one group of nadarians, which in turn are just one kind of invertebrate. But here is another type of nadarian. What is this? This is a brain coral called that because it's a coral and it looks like a brain. So believe it or not, corals are actually relatives of the jellies. They're part of that same phylum. They're one of the nadarians. So jellies and corals are, they're not really close relatives, but they're part of the same overall group and they have a lot of common characteristics. But here's the crazy thing. When you look at a coral like this, it doesn't look like it has much in common with the sea jelly at this distance, right? But if you look at corals up close, they actually have a lot in common with jellies. Because corals, just like jellies, have a very, very simple body that basically con con consists of some tentacles to catch food, a stomach on the inside, and, and then a reproductive system to be able to make more corals or more jellies or whatever. Another member of this group, and a little, one where it's a little easier to see the resemblance because they're big enough that we can see the individuals, is the anemones. So if you look at the anemone here, you see all those tentacles? And you see that mouth in the middle? An anemone is kind of like a jelly that just lives on a rock. In fact, there's some jellies that we have here in the aquarium called the upside down jelly that actually are a jelly that have decided to start living on a rock. And maybe that's kind of how it started for anemones. But an anemone is the same basic body plan as a jelly, except instead of having that, those kind of stomachs that you can see on the outside in the belt, they have a mouth and they keep their stomach system and all their other stuff inside of there. But it's the same basic concept. But I know these animals still may not seem like they have much in common, but when we talk about nadarians, this one group, there actually is 
one thing that they all have in common. Every Nadarian that we've ever looked at has this, so far as we know. And these are these very, very specialized skin cells called nidocytes, or sometimes nematocysts. Basically, the tentacles of this anemone, just like the tentacles of, that, of those jellyfish we were looking at, and just like the teeny tiny little tentacles that you would find if you looked really, really close at that brain coral, all have these little microscopic cells in them that, are, that function as venomous stingers. So when an animal bumps into an anemone or bumps into a jellyfish, all these microscopic stingers shoot out of the skin of, that, of, of, that, of the anemone or the jelly and grab onto the animal so that the anemone can maybe swallow it and eat it. Or in the jelly's case, sometimes there'll even be venom injected too. And that'll immobilize the animal and allow that nadarian, whether it's a jellyfish or an anemone or even a coral, to then consume that. So weird as it is, this, this animal here is actually a predator. This animal actually waits for something to, to land on it and catches it. And it does this even though it doesn't have a brain, it doesn't have a heart. The nadarians are like the simp one of the simplest groups of animals that are, that are large enough to see with your eye. These animals are so simple that when you really get down to it, they basically just got a, they got a stomach, they've got a way to reproduce, and they got a, f a few tools here that they can catch things with. And that's really all they've got going on. So that's maybe the simplest group of invertebrates that we'll be talking about today. But there's other groups of invertebrates that we talk about a lot at the aquarium. And since we're getting questions about them, why don't we talk a little bit about one of my favorite groups, a group called the mollusks. Now, I'm going to ask Dana to bring a picture of a mollusk up on the screen. And hopefully she'll choose the most interesting one. <laughs> Let's see if she can find it inside of our collection of footage here. Aha! <laughs> she got my hint. So this is a example of a mollusk. Now the mollusks are another big group of invertebrates that all share certain common characteristics, but these ones are way more, these, these animals are way more complex than things like jellyfish. You know, jellyfish, like I said, are an anemone, a coral, they don't even have brains. Mollusks, like our good friend the octopus here, does actually have a brain. In fact, the octopus is famous as probably being the smartest of all the invertebrates. Outside of the, outside of the vertebrate family, which contains a lot of pretty smart animals, the invertebrates, well, they're not known for their brains in general, but the octopus actually is a pretty intelligent creature. Oftentimes their, their, their intelligence is compared to um, kind of like a young person, maybe a three or four year old. So the, because octopuses can do all sorts of things that you would only expect normally for, that humans would be able to do. Octopuses can solve certain kinds of puzzles. They can find their way through mazes. When you give them new stuff, they can kind of play with it and sometimes come up with new uses for it. Sometimes they'll, they'll take things like, uh, if, you look on the, if you look online, you can find lots of cool videos of this. An octopus was discovered a few years ago that it decided to start carrying around a coconut shell to live inside of. Um, when octopuses encounter things like bottles with lids, they can learn how to unscrew them. There's all sorts of weird, cool things that octopuses have proven themselves able to do. And they're able to do all that because they have to be really effective predators, and they, uh, and they are. And we got a good question about octopuses that made me want to start talking about this. Gage asked, how many crabs can an octopus eat? Well, that is a, that is a specific question, Gage. So it depends on, the, on the, I guess, the crab and the octopus. You know, if it's a giant Pacific octopus like this one, maybe several crabs if the crabs aren't too big. But a lot of the crabs this guy goes out after are actually pretty good size. So instead of thinking in terms of how many they eat, maybe it's better to think in terms of how much food they need every day compared to their body size. In the case of the GPO here, our short, our short name for the giant Pacific octopus, they need to eat about 2 to 4% of their body weight every day. And although I don't have a video of an octopus eating, we have a video of a cuttlefish, which is another close relative of the octopus eating. The cuttlefish is another kind of mollusk, and in fact is, in, in fact is part of the same group that the, uh, that the octopus is part of inside the mollusks. This is the group called the cephalopods. Cephalopods are things like cuttlefish and octopus and, and uh, squid. And you can probably see right away that these animals have some things in common. If you look at cephalopods, like the cuttlefish, the octopus, and the squid, what have they all got? Well, they've all got these arms and in some cases also tentacles. They all have this big part in the back called a mantle. And they have this middle section, their head. And the cephalopods are called that, by the way because their head and their feet are kind of connected to each other. So that middle section is the head, right? And then all the arms or legs come out of the front. So they call them the head foot animal, cephalopod, because cephalo, I guess, means head. But, uh, and pod means foot. But 
Where was I going with this? Let's- I talked all the way through that. Let's watch that entire cuttlefish video again, because I, I don't want to miss all the fun stuff that was in it. Alright, so. So this cuttlefish is demonstrating how most cephalopods eat. They all tend to be various kinds of, sometimes pursuit predators, other times ambush predators. But you'll notice a couple of cool things. One thing, the, the, the cuttlefish kind of spreads out its arms as it eats, and then it shoots out its tentacles to grab the crab or the shrimp that it's trying to catch. But watch another thing that happens. This is my other favorite thing about cephalopods. Anything interesting happening there? Yeah, right? <laughs> Whoa! Wasn't he like dark brown a second ago and now he's almost white? What happened? Cephalopods, like the cuttlefish, like the squid and the octopus, are some of the best, com are, well, I guess chameleons are probably the best chameleons, <laughs> but they're some of the best camouflagers. I was going to say some of the best chameleons. <laughs> they're some of the best camouflagers in the world. In fact, they're probably even better at camouflaging than chameleons are, because cephalopods can change the color and even the texture, in many cases, of their skin to blend into practically anything. So if an octopus wants to blend in with some seaweed, they can turn themselves, you know, brownish green. If they want to blend in with some red algae on some rocks, they can turn themselves red. If they want to look kind of scary and try to scare things off, they might flash all sorts of different colors. And, the cut and they can also change colors sometimes to show their mood and their behavior. So a lot of cephalopods use, the, that, use that color changing ability to communicate with each other. Sometimes when they're trying to reproduce, they might try to entice a mate. Other times they might try to do a threatening look to try to scare things off. It depends. But the cephalopods are a really amazing group of invertebrates. And again, they're just a small group inside of this even bigger group of invertebrates called the mollusks. Some of their really distant cousins in the mollusk family are things like snails and slugs and clams and stuff like that. Here's a sea hare. This is basically a slug that lives in the ocean. Um, let's see here. What's our next question? Evan and Sean had a good question. Do cuttlefish have different sets of tentacles? Well, as much as I love sea hares, let's go back to the cuttlefish real quick, because that is a good question, Evan and Sean. The cuttlefish actually are a little bit different from the octopus, right? Because the octopus, we all know, has, well, we probably all know, they're, they're named after it, right? They got eight arms. Eight, there. I'm, I don't know, I'm showing all my fingers. Eight arms. Now, the cuttlefish has got eight arms, but they also have two more appendages. They have two tentacles that come out in between. And the difference between arms and tentacles in the cephalopods is that the arms have suction cups all up and down them. And those suction cups, by the way, are one of the things that almost all cephalopods have. But the tentacles, which you only find in squid and cuttlefish, only have suction cups at the end on this kind of like grabby, grabby part. And you can see if you look at this really, what is this, a Humboldt squid? Some really large squid here. Um, you can see the arms are shorter. And although you can't really see it in this picture, there's suction cups all along the arms. And then the tentacles sticking out there, it's much longer. So when this cuttlefish was grabbing, it was shooting out its tentacles to grab and then using the arms to hold on to the crabs or the shrimp while it was eating it. Now, another good question just came in. How many hearts do octopuses have? That is a really good question from Olivia. So octopuses, just like the other cephalopods, have got three hearts. And their hearts are really, really simple compared to ours. If you've ever seen a picture of how a human heart works or anything like that, you might know that a human heart has several different chambers in it for pumping blood and moving blood to the lungs and stuff. Well, instead, the cephalopods have, have three hearts. Two of those hearts just basically pump water from each set of gills that the, the cephalopod has inside their mantle. So again, a cephalopod can be cuttlefish, squid, octopus, or the chambered nautilus. And then there's one heart in the middle that does all the rest of the work to move the blood around the body. And the blood of these animals is different from Mars, too. Like a lot of invertebrates, the cephalopods don't have blood that use, that's red like ours. Their blood is more of a kind of a whitish, bluish color and uses copper to, copper to hold on to oxygen rather than uh, iron like ours does. Let's see here. What's our next group of invertebrates that we should talk about? We have, ooh, let's see. Dana's going to surprise me. Let's see what she, what she finds here. Ooh, oh, I love this video. This guy's like, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm walking. I'm walking here. I'm going to I'm gonna fan my little, my, my little face mouth parts here. I, what are these things? I don't know. I'm going to wave them around. <laughs> so <laughs> those are called mouth parts, by the way, and they're used for filtering stuff out of the water and sensing things and so on and eating. <laughs> they have more specific names, but when you talk about the whole set of them, you, we oftentimes just call them mouth parts. So this is a crab, another kind of invertebrate. 
Now, crabs are a great example of an animal that doesn't have a bony skeleton like we do, right? Because crabs and all the other members of the family they belong, the, of the big phylum they belong to, which are called the arthropods, they've all got exoskeletons. So instead of having an endoskeleton like we do, that's a skeleton underneath your skin on the inside, and that's one of the things that all the vertebrates have, the arthropods have an exoskeleton, which is one of the main features of their whole family. They also, since they have this exoskeleton, have to have these clearly visible joints where they can bend their body. And that's actually what arthropod means. It means jointed feet or jointed legs. And arthropods can be anything from a crab to a lobster or, or like, like this, uh, this is a uh, squat lobster. Yeah, right, squat lobster here. Um, or also arthropods include a lot of things that you may have near you now. If you've got, uh, if you go outside in the backyard or anything like that, or when we're all allowed to go outside and do more stuff again, maybe for the playground or something, you might come across things like say ants and roly polies and stuff like that, or spiders. They're arthropods too, because they have that same kind of exoskeleton on the outside of their body. But when we talk about arthropods in the ocean, most of the time we're talking about a specific group of them called the crustaceans. And that's what, it ha that's what has things like crabs in it, lobsters, uh, shrimp, and I don't know why I can't think of more crustaceans off the top of my head right now. Uh, well, crabs and lobsters and shrimp. Oh, prawns. There's another, there's another one there. But there's also other arthropods that live in the ocean. One of my favorites here at the aquarium is the horseshoe crab, which is actually more closely related to spiders. So, and uh, then there's also there's all these other groups of arthropods in the ocean, too. There's amphipods and so on. We could go on and on. And arthropods are really important in the ocean. And although we usually look at arthropods as things that walk around, a lot of them in the ocean actually float. In fact, the water itself in the ocean, even if you've ever gone swimming in the ocean and accidentally swallowed some or maybe, uh, you know, gotten some of your mouth to, sh to squirt at a friend or something like that, you've probably had teeny tiny little arthropods on you and in your mouth and stuff like that because plankton oftentimes are arthropods. There's a number of tiny little arthropods that are some of the most important plankton in the ocean. And plankton, if you've never heard that word before, are the teeny tiny little floating organisms that are kind of the very bottom of the ocean food chain. These are some plant plankton here. So these are really, really, really tiny. They're microscopic. You need a microscope to see them. And these little floating, little bit kind of like plants, basically, these are algae. These things float around, right? They in turn get eaten by little tiny animal plankton, which we call zooplankton. And some of those zooplankton are arthropods. So they're like just, they're a lot like a crab, but they're just floating around. And while I'm on the subject, a lot of arthropods, when they're babies in the ocean, live as plankton too. So when you see a grown up crab, you know, walking on a rock, like this giant spider crab, its life didn't start that way. When it was, when it was first born, it floated around basically until it got big enough to be able to hold on to things on its own. So a lot of arthropods in the ocean start their lives as plankton but eventually settle down to be able to walk around as they get bigger. But then some of them stay small for their whole lives and on being plankton. And this is a big subject. I could go on about this for, well, for a long time. So I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff out there, but like I said, the invertebrates are such a big group that it's, it's kind of not fair, I don't think, to squeeze them into one half hour. We know we can talk about vertebrates, but vertebrates all have a lot in common with each other. Invertebrates, they're all these different groups of animals. All we're saying when we say something's an invertebrate is that it's not a vertebrate. And other than that, they have nothing in common with each other. So let's go look at another group of invertebrates that we talk about a lot here at the aquarium. Let's go to one of our other major groups that if you've ever been, in, been to the aquarium and uh, been to one of our touch pools, for example, you might, have, you might have encountered this group. This group is, well, there's actually two of the groups in here. So some of these are anemones. You've probably touched them in our touch pools. If anybody remembers, what are they again? They're... Nadarians, Nadarians, spelled with a silent C at the beginning, <laughs> and uh, the not, so that's C N I D A R I A N S A N S. Yes, did I say that fast enough? No. <laughs> anyway, if you you can you can find out. Don't worry, it's, it's pretty easy to look up. <laughs> and so the anemones are one group, right? But there's actually another group, another big group of invertebrates in this picture. Has anyone figured out what they are yet? That's right there, the sea stars that you see here. Sea stars are members of the other really impressive family of ocean invertebrates. And 
the other, you know, kind of th good thing that both these families are in here because the Nadarians, even though they're really impressive, again, that's the corals and the jellies and the anemones, Nadarians only live in the ocean, or almost only live in the ocean. There's no Nadarians, but there are no Nadarians whatsoever that live on land. Not a single one has figured out how to live, you know, and, walk, and hang out in the forest or whatever. They're all ocean animals. Ocean animals are sometimes coastal animals, sometimes in the mouths of rivers where the water's still a little salty. And sea stars, as well as all of their cousins, the urchins, the sea cucumbers, they're part of a family called the echinoderms. And the echinoderm family is also only ocean animals. So it's a really, really interesting question that it's kind of hard to answer in a short way. That for some, re for some reason, those two big families of invertebrates that are so successful in the ocean, the nadarians and the echinoderms, things like sea stars and stuff, they are so successful in the ocean that you find them from the shallowest parts all the way to the deepest parts of the ocean. They're everywhere. But in spite of that, they've never figured out how to live on land. On the other hand, though, another group of invertebrates, the arthropods, they've obviously figured out how to live on land. Arthropods occur, on, occur practically, every, on practically every part of the land on the earth, except for the parts that are covered in ice. So arthropods are both land and ocean animals, but nadarians and, and, and the echinoderms, like the sea stars, they aren't. Now I wonder if I'm getting any more questions. Are we getting any questions on, online here? I want to I want to take some more of these because otherwise I'm just gonna I'm just gonna babble on on my own. But uh, let's see some nor some more echinoderms or echinoderms. People people debate with me which way it's supposed to be pronounced. So if we, if we see how these uh, sea stars are hanging out here, that's uh, this is a group of these are called bat stars by the way. There's a lot of different kinds of sea stars. You know, when we look at sea stars, and this is true of most of the echinoderms, ur sea urchins are the same way. Um, they oftentimes look like they're just sort of sitting there, like they don't really have anything to do. Actually, though, sea stars and sea urchins are pretty active animals that actually do move around a lot. The thing is that they just tend to move so slowly that we don't really notice it. But if you watch a sea star for a long enough time, you will eventually see them move. And they have to move because sea stars are actually predators. On the bottoms of their bodies, I don't know if we have a video of this or not right now, but on the bottom of their bodies, or do I have an example? I don't think I do. Uh, sea stars have these weird kind of sucking straw things. They go, they go on the bottom of each arm. And those are called tube feet. Tube feet basically allow the sea star to suck onto surfaces and pull themselves along. And they pull themselves along and as they go, their goal is to find something that they can wrap onto and consume. Now, Alan had a very good question that, that's a great, that's a really nicely timed. Alan asked, where are the sea stars' mouths? Good question, Alan. So if the sea star is going to eat stuff, they've got to have a mouth somewhere. The mouth is actually on the bottom part of the body, the part, of course, that we can't see in this picture. But <laughs> this is why it'll be so great when we can all come back to the aquarium and check all these animals out in the touch pools together. Now... On the bottom of their body, like I said, there's a sort of a, there's, there's these five rows of two feet that all come together. In the middle of that, there's this kind of weird five-pointed mouth. That mouth on a sea star is a very weird mouth because the sea star doesn't chew, doesn't chew stuff with it or pull stuff into it that way. Instead, what the sea star does to eat, they spit their stomach out onto their food. So the sea star is going along the ocean floor. It's going just sea starring along with its little tube feet sucking onto things. And it finds something it wants to eat, wraps its body around it. Maybe that animal has a hard shell or something. It pulls that shell open. Then it spits its stomach out into it. All the food inside turns to goo. And then it sucks it all back in. Oh, and here you can see the picture of the bottom of a sunflower star. So all those dots, those are all tube feet. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. This is a great picture here. I know it's a little bit small, but you get the idea. You can see all those little, all those things. They have hundreds of these tube feet. And this, by the way, is a sea star that's got way more arms than the average sea star. Most of the time we think of sea stars having five arms, right? Sunflower star, stars can have, I don't know, I haven't counted them all. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I believe the count usually is 18 to 20. But I just wanted to verify my facts since I haven't said this in such a long time. But uh, did anyone do a better job counting than me? Let's see here. I would have, I would have, I would have found out how many this one has. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Did I, did I skip one? I keep on forgetting where I started. 
Well, somebody online should do a real good job of counting them and pass it on to me. Let me know. I want to know how many arms this thing has. Uh, they can have up to 24 in the sunflower star. So most stars, they tend to have a very specific number. But the thing is that when sea stars lose their arms, sometimes, sometimes two will grow back instead of just one. So this can lead to some variation in the number of arms that you see on an adult sea star. And in the sunflower stars, there might even be variations for other reasons than that. Now, Max had a great question about this. Do sea stars regrow their limbs? I guess I just answered that one a little bit. Yeah, they do. And depending on how they lose their limbs, like I was saying, sometimes they'll grow back and they'll, instead of just growing back one, it'll split. So basically, when they lose their arm, there's these places where the new regrowth starts from. And if that gets kind of torn in the right way, the arm will grow into two, into two instead of one. And the craziest part is in really weird situations, if this happens on the same arm enough times, they'll sometimes even grow another mouth there. So sea stars and urchins and stuff have this incredible ability to regenerate parts of their body that are damaged. Um, Alan had a good question too. Actually, if we want to go back to the sunflower star real quick, Alan asked, well, it doesn't, if we can, that's okay. Alan asked, what eats sea stars? The answer is sometimes other sea stars. The sunflower star here is known for going around trying to eat other sea stars. This is one of the reasons why in the aquarium we have to make sure that we don't put a sunflower star in with some of the smaller stars like bat stars because this big guy will just come along we'll go over them and just spit its stomach out onto them and consume them. Um, but also there's a few other animals that eat sea stars too. Things like lobsters and certain kinds of crustaceans can pull them open. Also there are some, some uh, marine mammals that can eat them. Otters are famous for this. Otters are one of the animals that is smart enough to figure out how to break open a hard, the hard skin of a sea star and eat the insides. And while we're on the subject of sea stars, Miguelito asked a really good question. What happens when stars are sick, when sea stars get sick? That is actually a very good question, my friend, and a, uh, an important one, too, because actually the sea stars did get sick a, a, a little while ago. Starting, I think, when did, when did, when did wasting uh, syndrome start? Was it 10, 12, 15, 7, 20 years ago? Well, it, yeah, no, it peaked, yeah, it peaked like just like five years ago, right? So, about, so a few years ago, scuba divers started to notice that sea stars weren't, weren't around in the places they usually saw them in when they went scuba diving. And this is out in the ocean, by the way. Not, luckily, at the aquarium, we never had this issue. But in the ocean, scuba divers would go to kelp forests and stuff along the California coast, and they found that the sea stars just weren't there. And eventually, scientists discovered that there was a disease, a sickness, that the sea stars were getting that was actually caused by a virus that floated around in the water, and this disease caused something called, called wasting syndrome, basically. And what happened when the sea stars got this is that their bodies would, it's kind of gross to be totally honest, their bodies would just sort of start to kind of fall apart. And th because of this, sea stars disappeared from a lot of places in California for, for several years. And it's only recently that we've seen some of them start to reappear because the, the surviving sea stars basically may have developed an immunity to this disease or something like that, or perhaps the disease kind of ran its course, just like we're hoping this one we're dealing with right now will. And the uh, sea stars were gradually able to start to repopulate. But still, to this day, in a lot of places, there aren't as many sea stars as there were, say, five, six, or seven years ago because this disease came and just, and just wiped a lot of them out, which is, uh, wow, this is the first time I've told that story where it was so relevant to a current situation, huh? So let's all make sure we maintain our physical distancing, everybody, so we all stay nice and safe. Now, because we don't want to end up like the poor sea stars. But don't worry, sea stars are recovering. Uh, there are no, none of them went extinct or anything so far as we know. They'll, they'll be coming back. They just, this sort of things happen in nature. Do we have any other questions while we wait to wrap up? That was a deep one, Miguelito. I'm, I'm really glad you asked that. Um, well, let's see if we go, can go recap then. So we talked about invertebrates as being several different groups, right? So, and if we want to really talk about animals in a way that makes more sense, rather than say vertebrate or invertebrate, we should really just look at different major groups of animals. And think of vertebrates as being just one of those major groups. So if you think of it this way, in that vertebrates are one major group of animals and their shared characteristic is they all have this spinal column, right? And the skeleton attached to it. Now, another major group of animals is nadarians all of which have this basically basic kind of ring-shaped body and, ten and have these tentacles with the stinging cells on them. Then another major group of animals is the echinoderms, 
things like sea stars and sea urchins and sea cucumbers that have these tube feet they hold on to the, uh, the ocean floor with. And then there's the arthropods, another major group that all have an exoskeleton with jointed limbs. So if you think of it that way, you're kind of looking at the way life works in a way that's not so focused on things similar to us. It's not a way of looking at animals and saying, oh, well, there's the group that's like us, the vertebrates, and then there's the everything else group. Instead, maybe we shouldn't talk about invertebrates at all, but should just say groups other than vertebrates, such as arthropods or mollusks or nadarians or echinoderms. And by the way, that's just the four that I had time for right now. There's hundreds, I think. Well, maybe not hundreds. I don't know. If you count all the worms, how many, how many other phyla of invertebrates are there? Hundreds might be too much. Don't quote me on that. We'll have to check that one. But just in terms of worms alone, there's like, what, a, a dozen? I don't know. Worms are like multiple phylums just on their own. So my point is that we say invertebrates, it's such an incredibly diverse thing. It's like we're saying, okay, vertebrates are this one small part of nature, and then everything else is an invertebrate. Ah, oh, we got a number now. Stewie has helped me out with this. So there's about 30 different phyla of invertebrates. So if we think about phylums, that's those big, massive groups that all the animal, each animal belongs to one of them. Vertebrates are just one of those groups. In fact, and then all these other things, all these other things, I came down from hundreds to 30. I, did, I, really, was, I really knew that never well, didn't I? Well, as, I, as I, we always say on this show, we sometimes learn as we talk to you. Um, uh, there's all these other groups, all these other phyla alongside. And we talk about these four at the aquarium a lot. We talk about the echinoderms, we talk, or echinoderms, we talk about the nadarians, we talk about the, now I'm forgetting them, the mollusks, the arthropods. But then there's a whole bunch of other groups we just don't get to because a lot of them are things that you only see very rarely or things that people maybe aren't as interested in talking about. But let me tell you, those other groups are interesting too. If you want to learn about worms, there's a, lot of great, there's a lot of great science still to be done about worms, especially ocean worms. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things we learn about them all the time. So invertebrates really are worth studying and learning about. Really fascinating creatures. And I hope you guys have enjoyed learning about them here at the Aquarium's Online Academy today. We will be back at 1 o'clock with another class if you want to join us again. Uh, if not, you can always remember to check out our programs after the fact online. You can, always, you can view any of the programs that we've... We've done in the past few weeks. While we're live, you can always text questions to us at this number right here, 562-286-1838. And if you have questions afterwards, if you're not watching us live, you can always email us at live at lbaop.org. Again, that's live at lbaop.org. That's for Long Beach Aquarium of Pacific. So thanks very much, everybody, and have a great rest of your day. Hope to see you again soon.